Hi, my name is Kelly Vodden. I'm with the Environmental Policy Institute and Associate Vice President of Research and Graduate Studies at Grenfell Campus Memorial University. We're here in Rocky Harbor in Gross Morn at the Coastal Communities in a Changing Climate Summit, which has been organized by Grenfell Campus in conjunction with Gross Morn Cooperating Association. And we're here to listen to what a few of our residents from the Gross Morn area have to say about the changing climate and the ways that communities have responded. Well, I'm George Tucker, and I'm councillor at Town of North Point, have been for 16 years now. Yeah. My name is Gene Bellows, I'm also a councillor at North Point, I also am on VOB radio, and I'm a member of the uh, Peacekeepers of Western Newfoundland. Could you tell us a little bit about what changes in climate you've seen in your community, either of you? Well, I think probably this... This last couple of years have been dramatically changed for us. Uh, we've had uh, the biggest kind of storms. Uh, we are well known here in the town of Norris Point for winds up to 100, 216 kilometers. Uh, we do have uh, that tidal mass that they talk about with those winds, and we've seen quite a bit of difference in the erosion along our shorelines here. Absolutely. Anything else you've seen that you like Well, to I, I have not been here as long as George. I'm, you know, uh, actually living here for uh, seven years now. Uh, but my first year here, we had uh, 204 kilometers and blew my garage down. Second year, I had 208 and blew the greenhouse down. Oh, my. So, yes, they were, <laughs> they were heavy winds. Uh, I, uh, you know, I think uh, last winter was, to me, the strangest winter for, for climate because it was snow, then rain, then snow, it wasn't a continuous thing, and I think that's how the weather is affecting. I don't know if the Gulf Stream, or they say last year was a Nina, you mm -hmm. know, she has effect on us, so. Uh, but in the long term, for me, I, I grew up in uh, Cornerbrook. Uh, then it was, the, the winters, I don't think they were any colder, but uh, you got snow and it lasted for the whole mm -hmm. winter, and the, and the bay used to freeze up. That doesn't happen now. It's kind of erratic. It's more fluctuating. It's more fluctuating. Yeah, yeah. So, have you seen that, those kinds of fluctuations as well, George? Oh my gosh, yes, yeah. Well, we we notice it all the time. Uh, particularly, as Gina said, that our bay out here has been a number of years since somebody's been able to drive up over that, get a pickup load of wood, and drive back down. So, what, that's one of the effects. That was my next question. How yeah. has the change? How have the changes in climate? affected your residents or, or your town and how it operates? Oh, and one, so access to wood is one of the things. Well, it, it would be. It was one form of getting wood. And in, then, of course, it was the easiest access in over the hills here. So you go on up through the arm, go up through Millbrook, and you're scot-free right from your door all the way up through. But now you have to be so careful because even this year, uh, we had a, a good opportunity for people to use the ice here uh, to go up on the hills like a, a deadly freight when they came back and found that the ice was starting to break up. Yeah. Now that's from going up in the morning to coming back in the evening. Wow. So there's so much uncertainty. So how would people get their wood now? How, how is that oh, the, most people here got permits for out around the community okay. anyway, right? But there's just that some people had permits for up further up okay. and they would only use that or utilize that during the winter time. So what about some of the storms? Uh, how has that affected the infrastructure in the town? Has there been any threats to some of your Well, people? let's see, you know. It's a restaurant sure? next door to me. It's roof passed over my place. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's yeah, part of the roof is still down the garden. The <laughs> okay. okay. So, yeah, we've had so damage right there. Oh, no, there's oh, nothing left to it. It oh, blew, no. completely blew yeah, apart. Okay. First it blew the roof <laughs> off, and then the insurance company was giving them a hard time about what they were going to do. And then another storm came and blew the rest of the building down, so it took care of everything. So was the restaurant replaced? No. Uh, no. 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 So you no. lost one of the yeah. restaurants yeah. in the yeah. town. And if we go back a few years, Gene, uh, where we had a really bad winter one year, and we had some horrific winds, and there were houses that were literally ripped apart, and... Uh, Chesterfields and chairs that were found over in Bombay in somebody else's garden. And there's a story here told many years ago. The church bell was found up in Westerin Head after a big storm. Mm -hmm. So it'll give you an idea of how, how bad it can be. And with those winds and guaranteed to be high tides, mm -hmm. you know, those surges are going to be extremely mm -hmm. high. Mm -hmm. I've seen boats that normally would always be well below the dockside with the nose of the boat up on top of the dock. Mm -hmm. 
that the tides have been so high. So what, is there anything people, either individuals or the town, have been doing to try to cope with these changes or plan for the future? If well, to get worse? I, think, I think we can both agree that uh, our, our council has moved forward very much so. Uh, we've been, I, I've been kind of involved with this, uh, uh, the climate change thing through Ray Cazan when he started 10 years ago with this, right? So I've had a little bit of dealings with that over time. But we as a council have come to the point and consensus that uh, we know there's a big issue, we know there's going to be bigger issues, and we know that it's looking at our coastline alone here in, in Norris Point, uh, that we're going to have to really buckle down and get something done. Hmm. We're due for uh, uh, town planning again, right? 2019. 2019. Oh, okay. So part of that, I think we have to address and get some of the people from environment to say, okay, what's going to be safe, what's going to be not safe, mm -hmm. and, and put some rules down. Because mm -hmm. now, I, I kind of mentioned before, even though we know about areas that uh, possible erosion on that, but somebody owns the land, they say, well, it's our land. I mean, you know, can we do it? And if you give them permission to build a house and anything happens, then they blame you for giving them yeah. no permission. So mm -hmm. we're caught in these things all the time. Are there sp supports that you've had or that you need as a council to help you? Well, we've had environment come in a couple oh, of times. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if there, we really think there's an issue somewhere, we have them come in and check. And they have been checking this area okay. as uh, on the slides it was showing monitoring. Yeah. We always, in terms of uh, allowing anybody to build uh, structurally near any water source, uh, would have environment give the okay before that could be could actually be done. You know, but I would just like to say this to you: um, we're talking about environment here, and if anybody out there is listening, they're hearing the words environment, and they're, they're, all of their thinking is going toward land structure or some part of, uh, of, uh, of that part of the environment that's being damaged. But we also got to stop and think about the environment that's, the environmental um, issues that are occurring within the water itself. Mm -hmm. And a good example of that is um, last year in Black Tickle, Labrador, they started fishing uh, Pacific bass. Mm -hmm. And that is a history breaker because there's never been bass in that part of of the Labrador. Yes. Okay. The bass normally come as far as the St. Lawrence and then go on up through, but because of those very strong hurricane winds and the warm waters, mm -hmm. it just passed the cool water of the, mm -hmm. of the uh, St. Lawrence and came on up through. And keeping in mind that these are a bit of a predator fish, mm -hmm. so they're getting into the waterways, they're eating all the trout and the salmon and whatever else it can get its teeth into. So that that's an that environmentally yeah. yeah, and there's been a lot of species that they've discovered. Not a lot, but they have found uh, species that have never been this far north before. Mm -hmm. so, have you heard of that in, in Bombay? Are people talking about yeah, species? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's a, there was one. I forget what was they found in Bombay last year. And it was the first time they'd ever. I forget which which mm -hmm. one it was, but first but time there, yeah, it. but there is some smaller <laughs> fish too that you know most of them are not even aware of. Mm -hmm. that the fishermen are catching them and they don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. Now, the, this particular bass, by the way, has come in such great numbers that you could literally take a, a net and dip it down over the side of the wharf and flip it up and throw them in on, in on the wharf because as far as we know, there's no laws that we know that says you can't catch them. I guess that creates a new opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 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 Good eating. But, I mean, <laughs> but like the green crab that's been such a nuisance to everybody, this fish will be a nuisance to the people up that way. Mm -hmm. and, in, in, and in our rivers, if they start getting in our rivers and killing off our salmon and trout. Right? There's something to keep an eye on and yeah. try to monitor at least. Yeah. So it's just another way that uh, the, the erosion aspect is taking place as well. You know, It doesn't necessarily always have to be land. Great. Is there anything yeah. else you'd like to add no. about how climate and, you know, change? I, we, you know, everybody thinks about you know the, the, how cold it, it gets or, or, or stuff like that. But I think more than anything else, uh, the climate is more erratic than it was. Like winter was winter at one time. Now you're never sure what it is. You know, we'll have these cold. I mean, we have freezing weather. You know, we had below zero last mm -hmm. night. 
Yeah. So. One thing I've heard about is the freeze thought how it affects the roads. Mm. You're both municipal councillors. So uh, has that affected your road budget? Yeah, that's does affect. Oh, yeah. my. Yeah. That's, that's an ongoing thing. Yeah. Man, oh, man. Yeah. There's nothing in this world. I, you can't keep ahead of it. There's no way to keep ahead of it. So there's, I guess, one hand, you don't know how to budget for salts and things in, in the winter, and you yeah. also don't know. What well, you you budget to what you expect is going to happen, but mm -hmm. always the unexpected. Yeah. You know, I will say there used to be an adage here, and there still is an adage today, of every five minutes the weather changes in Newfoundland. Uh, these days, I think we can go closer to two. <laughs> two and a half. <laughs> Great. And we can get four seasons in one day sometimes. In one day, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess the good thing about that is it makes you able to adapt. If Newfoundland yeah. and Labradorians are used to the changes all the time, if, if, if it's any, just changing if, more. If <laughs> any society can adapt, Newfoundlanders can, because they have had to. That's the only reason they survived. Yeah. Just a little more warmer weather, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just spent a month in the Bahamas. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the outer <laughs> islands. <laughs> Yeah, we were both smart. We got away this time early. Thank you very much. Oh, no really problem. appreciate no problem. it. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Would you mind just telling us your name and what community you live in? Please? Sure. I'm Kathy Leopold Madigan, and I live in Woody Point. Great. How about, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your role in the community, how long you've lived there, or ways you're involved in the community? Okay, well, I moved, we bought a house in the community in 2010. I'm American, my husband's a Newfoundlander, and we moved there full-time about five years ago now. Great. And my role in the community is, I kind of think of myself as maybe a pain in some people's sides. <laughs> because when you adopt a community, you care very, very strongly about it, and you don't take advantage, you don't take it for granted, you right. know, so. So what kinds of changes in the climate have you seen since you've been coming to the community and living in the community, or also if you've heard people talk about changes in climate over time? That would also be interesting. I have, you know, my time in the community has been rather short, but I have noticed that in the time I've been here, I've been told by the old timers, we've had the most snow we ever had in 30 years. I've heard that we've had, the bay hadn't been frozen for years and years and the bay was frozen. Now the bay's not frozen again. This past winter, we had a big um, heavy snowfall and then warmer temperatures and rain and we had you know severe flooding we had landslides road was washed out we were without power for 27 hours um, there's one house uh, that someone had built a vacation a summer home really big summer home that was on a hillside the hillside behind them about two-thirds of it came down and all the huge trees that came down it was during a rainstorm uh, they uh, they landed about 20 I'm sorry about 50 to 60 feet from the house wow. so we see differences that way I know my town is talking about the flat lying areas how the easterly winds are bringing the water in and there's concerns about that our seawalls crumbling okay. so you know somehow we're with our demographics we're an older community and you know where will the funding come for that kind of thing so so they know something's different a lot of climate change denial are there but they know things are different. Yeah, are they saying that these kind of events are more frequent? They're saying it's more frequent yes or it's more um, everything's more not as usual as it used to be. It was more predictable. It's more unpredictable okay. now. I think that's the word. Okay. And I think people tend to stick to the word of glo the word global warming or the phrase. And as we get severe cold or something, they want to say, well, this isn't global warming, <laughs> you know? Right. And so in some ways, I think it's a misunderstanding of really what's going on. Okay. So, so what, do you, what has been done in the community that you know of, either by individuals or the town, to try to deal with some of these changes? I, I think the town is still trying to figure out what to do, what to identify. I know they've um, finally put together a risk management plan, and I haven't seen it yet. So, okay. But I know that's been years in the making, and now they're talking about trying to track the infrastructure. They're not sure what they have, mm -hmm. you know, as far as water lines and sewer lines, and they've talked about erosion. We've talked about the seawall. So it's more of a identifying what's... Um, could be impacted by okay. the changes. So, so trying to understand what yeah. you, where, where attention yeah. needed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I don't think they've made any plans to do anything yet. And of course, the other thing everybody talks about is how much more wind there is now than there used to be. Okay. So. 
Hard to know what you can do with that. Build stronger structures, I guess. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Um, would you have any suggestions about either what the town should be doing or what other kinds of support agencies or su- supports might be provided to help either residents or the town adapt to climate change? I think it would be good to have more awareness for people. Mm-hmm. Um, as I was saying at lunch, you know, right now with the reporting, everything's on in the cities. Mm-hmm. And so the little communities don't know what their experiences is happening in other places too. And I think if you understand it's a systemic widespread um, thing that is going on, I think it would make people accept it more, mm-hmm. and um, so you'd get the public support behind it instead of just saying, "Yeah, it's the weather." So <laughs> trying know? to find ways to share stories right, across rural right, communities. Right, 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 and I think also for the councils as much guidance and help as they can get because they're volunteers that ran for office and they don't have, for the most part, the knowledge. And I think having the knowledge available to them would help a lot. Right. So. Thank you. Anything else you'd like to add? I don't think so, except it's a great place to live. <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful. It is. <laughs> Thank you very You're much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Sure. Yeah. Let us know your name and who you work with or your, or your role in the Grossmore region. Sure. Uh, I, my name is Darlene Small, and I work for Parks Canada, and I work for our field unit. So that means the large region of basically western Newfoundland and okay. all of Labrador. Okay. Um, but most of the people who work for our large field unit are based here in Grossmore National Park, so our office is in Rocky Harbor. And my job specifically is external relations manager. Mm -hmm. So our team looks after visitor communications, we do website, we do tours and promotions, we do community relations, which is very significant for what we're talking about Mm -hmm. and this symposium itself, and uh, we do media relations. So can you tell us about the changes in climate you've seen in the park or if it's not your own observations, what you've heard about climate change in the park over the years? Well, on a day-to-day basis, actually, we're managing with impacts of climate change in the park in terms of even just right down to visitor facilities. Mm -hmm. So I can give you an example. Um, uh, Last spring, actually, no, it would have been two two springs ago, uh, we had a trails consultant, a hiking trails consultant, who's based in Canmore near Banff National Park, a leading expert in hiking trail and hiking trail sustainability and development come and do an assessment of our trails for us and we were having very significant infrastructure issues on a section of our green gardens trail a very popular hiking trail on the south side of the park near woody point and trout river and uh, what he assessed was the section of this green gardens trail called wallace brook we were losing it to coastal erosion Mm -hmm. so we kept going in there requiring almost weekly maintenance so there were huge resources issues for us and much more importantly visitor safety issues Mm -hmm. Um, because the boardwalk was failing um, it would collapse um, it would erode much more quickly than any typical um, other trail infrastructure so this consultants advice was you will lose that trail to coastal erosion Mm -hmm. so in the end we closed that trail and it was a big loss it was a loss for people who know and love that trail it was a loss for visitors who didn't even know what they would be missing when they would come to the park so So that's one example, but I think the opportunity side of the climate change issue is that, okay, well, we understand now that this is really not feasible or not safe, but what can we do in, instead of that? Mm-hmm. So this trail consultant identified to us that, well, look at what your landscape is and look at what's changing in your landscape. So if you have heavy, boggy areas, try as much as you can to not use boardwalk. Mm-hmm. Um, look at how you design your trails. So in Grossmore National Park, when it was first developed, basically we looked at the beautiful areas that are here and built a hiking trail that went from A to B as as fast as you could, almost like a fall line for a skier or something, you know. But he said, no, what you want to do is look where the natural erosion is, predict what the impacts of climate change might be in terms of where the water's coming, where the drain might be in the future, and then route your trail appropriately. So right now we're doing some rerouting work in Green Gardens. So while we've lost that Wallace Brook section, we actually are now going to reroute and take in some of the other beautiful areas down there okay. that take you from the tablelands kind of geolo- geological impact right down to the beautiful coastal experience of Green Gardens area. Mm-hmm. Same with Grossmore Trail. We're going to re-ro- reroute the uh, trail that goes up to Grossmore Mountain. 
So a number of the trails were identified as being at risk or, or, yes. or will be in the future? Yes, and I think actually a lot of hikers in our park, especially regular hikers who know the park well, would certainly identify that we had ongoing maintenance challenges of some of our key trails in the park. And of course that comes from just you know, regular uh, wear and tear on a, on a trail. But the opportunity for us is to understand what the future predictions might be for the climate mm -hmm. and then to adapt our construction and trail design techniques. Sure. And we were talking a little bit earlier about how important hiking trails are for Grossmore National Park. It's one of the major uses of the park. It, it is, draws indeed, yeah. Now, of course, Parks Canada, as, as the, um, you know, we're, we're conservation and ecological integrity are our, the key parts of our mandate, there's no doubt about that. But on the visitor side of things, our, our aim is to bring Canadians into their national parks. I mean, they own the parks and it's an opportunity for Canadians, especially people who live in urban areas, to reconnect with nature and to understand the importance of nature and intact ecosystems and wildlife that are indigenous to an area. So, so it is important for us to have good safe trails that are low maintenance costs so that Canadians can come and actually see what a protected ecosystem is like and really get reconnected with nature. Do you know if there's been if there have been any ecological changes linked to climate change speaking of the biodiversity in, in the park and those kinds of changes that have been observed that you know of? Um, well certainly in terms of the uh, the changes in seasons and the freeze thaw cycle we hear a lot about that now it's interesting in gross more and um, you know in in the northern parks in Canada we're learning so much more what we call ways of knowing so we're mm -hmm. listening to the traditional knowledge of the Inu the Inuit the Métis the, the indigenous peoples of Canada but here in Gross Morn the people who grew up in these communities generation over generations they're they're the local knowledge holders mm -hmm. and they're telling us things about how the bays used to freeze or the ponds used to freeze so that these sensitive bogs that we have in this park here in the winter you could safely travel over those bogs because they were frozen and they were frozen consistently through the winter mm -hmm. but now we're starting to see a little bit of freeze thaw cycle the last couple winters particularly mm -hmm. the locals tell us that they really see that difference. So that has major impacts for us in terms of how people can safely travel over parts of the park, um, be it snowshoeing or backcountry skiing or snowmobiling, which we do have some limited snowmobiling permitted in our national park within certain corridors. So, so is that limited? People are not traveling those same routes anymore? Yes, there are, people are adapting their routes. We're having to, so for example, with snowmobiling, where we have such defined corridors for snowmobiling, that's how we manage the impact from an ecological perspective of that activity. If we're starting to notice ponds and water features that used to freeze but that now don't, we're going to have to change our snowmobile corridors. Otherwise you see ecological damage in those bog areas, Ex sure. Exactly, ecological damage as well as a, a, a safety risk right. for our users. So, I guess the other area I can see would be impacted by that freeze thaw would be the infrastructure. So the road for parks, this park scan is involved in roads yes. maintenance in the park, for example. Absolutely. I'm sure that your uh, engineering staff are uh, Finding challenges related to that. I don't know. Very insightful question. <laughs> so, especially through Grossmore National Park, we have what we call a through highway. Mm -hmm. So, Route 430, which is the major connector, of course, between Deer Lake and the Northern Peninsula. So, this is the life cycle road for mm -hmm. anyone who lives north of this region. Mm -hmm. um, and we maintain the massive section of highway that goes through the park. So, another example that just happened in this epic January flood that we had this year was our mill. Brook area. So anyone driving now Highway 430 between Gross Morn and Deer Lake, all you need to do is look at the Millbrook, what we call the day use area. So it was a lovely area that was just off the highway. Mm -hmm. You could pull over, take a rest, stretch your legs, have a picnic, enjoy the, the view. And there was also a wharf there. Um, but that completely washed out in January. And so now as you drive on that highway, you'll see four massive boulders that we've put on what remains of the, the, the asphalt leading into that day use area and then if you just look beyond please do not go beyond the boulders <laughs> if you just look beyond the boulders you'll see the massive sinking okay. of that road that led down to that day use area and what's interesting is we just learned we're now as the snow is melting we're starting to realize what re how much impact we've had in that section and it looks like where we had built the road to go into that day use area 
where it has collapsed is actually where Mill Brook has now rerouted back along that road. And apparently that was originally the riverbed for that road. So we're learning as well. We're learning about our infrastructure and how we need to respect nature and where we need to build and not build and, and, ta and understand where the natural systems will be going and, and adapt that way. So. so will there be more assessment work happening then like you did with the trails for the roads and other? Absolutely. It's going to be an ongoing part of, I mean, it already is. It's already a part of what we do. I mean, we, we are aware that climate change is, you know, the challenge of our generation mm -hmm. and certainly within Parks Canada, it's, it's a challenge, but it also is our opportunity to plan better to do infrastructure better, to work on our science and monitoring, you know, most importantly, to understand what a natural ecosystem is and to adapt that way, so. Would you, would, does Parks Canada work with the communities in the park on climate change, understanding climate change and adapting to climate change? We have, we can do better, for mm -hmm. sure. We do, yes, a little bit, but I think these kinds of symposiums, bringing people together and really sort of, you know, collectively understanding that this is everybody's uh, challenge and opportunity is really important. Um, but we do quite a bit of what we would call stakeholder relations. So, for example, our superintendent meets about once every two months with the mayors of all our surrounding communities so we come together now you know we'll typically talk more about um, operational issues or you know there, there's it's, it's a wide agenda it's mm -hmm. essentially we uh, the mayors set the agenda for what okay. we would talk about but I think more and more as we all collectively understand that this is important um, we'll talk more about climate change but certainly our mayors are one of that local knowledge group that we right. seek you know when we're thinking about making a substantial change or an investment in the park we'll share that with them and then a lot of them will say well you know back in the 60s when my father was cutting wood and the, you know I mean the, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get that kind of local knowledge so we do work with the mayors in a nice formalized way um, but we need to do more I think we need to do more with our communities especially our individual residents mm -hmm. and I think I suspect when there's an emergency you all come together as well I, yeah. I'm thinking about the flood event I suspect yeah. there's a lot of communication between Parks Canada and the communities about the kinds of emergency situations you're facing. Yes, that. certainly in terms of the first response. Yes, yeah. the first responders are there. We're very integrated as community like that. But I think these kinds of big, you know, natural climate change affected events are, are, are the almost the humbling wake-up calls that we're all collectively having. Mm -hmm. So because when you look at the damage, you know, it, it, if you had any any uh, reasons or relationship issues in the past where you wouldn't work together, it suddenly pales in comparison by the need to really all of us understand what the issues are. And it's an opportunity in crisis, I guess. It truly is, yeah, like the ultimate wake-up call. And, <laughs> yeah. But no, I mean, I think uh, you know that we're so fortunate in our community through groups like the Grossborn Cooperating mm -hmm. Association, which across the national park system and across our country, there is no cooperating association like we have That's here in Grossborn. <laughs> um, I actually worked in Jasper National Park before I came here and I, I was the liaison for the cooperating association there and when I told them I was moving to Gross Moor and they said oh you have no idea <laughs> you know really the the um, scope of work that they do how much they bring our communities together it's truly extraordinary um, and then of course with Grenfell the university uh, we've done some good work we can do so much more um, so we're really lucky here not only are we knit together um, you know, geographically and connectivity from landscapes and stuff, but we have such a really engaged group of people who yeah. we all want to work together. Well, we're happy to be part of part of the Grossworn group of interests, I guess. Yeah, not cult. It. It's not a cult. It's <laughs> a yeah, 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 that's right. yeah, we work well together. <laughs> One last question, because you are covering the whole Western region, mm -hmm. and I have the opportunity to ask this question. Are the changes that you're seeing or, or hearing about in Grossmorn different than what you're hearing about in the tip of the north on the tip of the northern peninsula or on the Labrador Straits parks areas. It's really, really interesting question because you know um, our stakeholders are quite different in in nature, if from park to park and landscape mm -hmm. to landscape. And when we look at, say, for example, the Torn Gap Mountains National Park right. in the very northern tip of Labrador, I mean, you, you couldn't get much different in terms right. of landscape and ecosystems and cultural history and, and indigenous, you know, really the Torngats is the Inuit homeland and 
um, the Inuit are thriving, you know, mm -hmm. and so and they're cooperatively managing that park with us. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different governance structure. Mm -hmm. um, it's a different set of knowledge. It's a different um, mandate for that park. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of uh, of how they work um, hand in hand on the science side of things and on the visitor experience side of things, it is quite different. Mm -hmm. But what's great is that we can take that kind of learning and approach mm -hmm. and bring it to our other the other parts of our region, right? And I think got, there's been a lot of attention to climate change in the northern Labrador and yep. working with the university uh, along with your Nazi government and exactly the university the there's a couple of key researchers who I think have worked with the Nazi government and and set a lot of their research out of base camp for Torengats so base camp is actually just outside the boundary of the park and that's run by the Nazi government exactly as you said and so I think there's two or three leading researchers from the university who are who've done real amazing work on there in terms of Oh gosh, I can't. There's some of the um, looking at the caribou populations there, I think, and understanding how their range is changing as the vegetation mm -hmm. is growing longer in seasons and moving north in the park. So there's lots of great. Now, I'm no, no expert on that, but if you ever wanted to, you know, there's a couple of our scientists who work very closely mm -hmm. with your. Uh, with your team, but uh, yeah, no, it's a it shows how the uh, issues are so different region to region. Though. The, the caribou, the melting glaciers, I believe, up there. Yes, the yeah. Different sea ice issues. Sea ice, everything, like from the polar bear populations and how they you know, what their ranges are. Um, the traditional harvesting is a very different um, world up there. However, it. The principles are the same, you know, in terms of everyone, first of all, acknowledging and then sharing the information that they have, whether it's through a more Western style science mm -hmm. database and a model mm -hmm. or traditional ways of knowing and then working together on yeah, the. Working together, yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Oh, pleasure. And thank you so much for initiating this. It's been fascinating. Yeah. So far, it's not over yet. Yeah, that's right. Looking forward to the rest of it. Yeah, it's great. Thank, thank you. you. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Could we start out by you telling us your name and uh, which community you live in and a little bit about your role in the community? Uh, well, Trudy Taylor Walsh, live in Norse Point, uh, lived there since 2000 and yeah. Local resident. Okay. Yeah, local resident. So could you tell us a little bit about the changes you've seen since you've lived there in climate uh, or what you've heard other people talk about how, how climate has changed in North Point over the years? I think that we're seeing more damage to people's homes mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, their homes and their vehicles and stuff like that because of the wind events. Uh, one thing I've noticed is that it's a really tidy community mm -hmm. and people, it's a necessity. It's not necessarily that we're all neat freaks, but we are neat freaks when it comes to protecting our property because of the wind. So you don't have stuff, or you have stuff tied down. Anything that's left out around is tied down. But uh, what's happened recently is that we've increased the security of our houses. A lot of us are now putting on Lexan on our windows. Okay. It's like this uh, higher uh, level protection uh, from plexiglass. So we put it on over our large windows okay. and it stays on year round. Okay. Uh, we had a storm uh, in 2014, uh, and just us alone, we had over $30,000 worth of damage at our house. Our vehicles and our roof uh, lost a window and stuff like that. So the number of events like that that are happening where there's personal, uh, uh, people are uh, having damage to their personal property, I think is increasing. So we're having to change the way that we're building the houses and, and making modifications now okay. to our houses. Yeah. So is it mostly individual action, or have you seen uh, some moves by the municipality as well to, to help the community with adaptation? I haven't seen it by the, by the municipality. is not saying that they haven't done it, mm -hmm. but I haven't seen it. Okay. But I know that uh, we're talking to each other. So, you know, someone that went and did the research and found out, for example, that this Lexan is available. Some people were looking at uh, shutters and stuff, but we found out you know, there are two places in Cornerbrook, for example, that supply this material, and we're sharing that information mm -hmm. amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, more people in the local community have uh, their own personal weather stations now, okay. because the weather station here, for example, is in a terrible location, and it doesn't give a true measure of the, the wind speeds and stuff like that. And so we share that information around mm -hmm. and get an idea uh, I may not know that there's a, 
if someone finds out that there's a wind warning coming, we, you, you let everybody know. And how so do you I do that? Texting? Yeah, Facebook it is. Or? It's texting. Okay. Yeah, it's texting. It's not Facebook because texting is a lot easier. The message comes in right away. And then the other thing that's going on is that when the storm is happening, uh, everyone's got their own informal groups that they're connected with each other through the storm. Like, how are you making out? What's going on? And stuff like that. Are you prepared? You know, do you have your... It's true. Do you have your uh, chargeable, uh, your drill in? Do you have your extra plywood? Do you have your screws and stuff in case you lose mm -hmm. a window? Like we do that, mm -hmm. and we remind each other, yeah, about that when you we know there's a storm the coming. Like keeping a helmet, yeah. and shoes by the door. In case mm -hmm. the yeah, especially when my kids were younger, uh, we started doing that. Uh, kids were in hockey, and like if you go out in the wind like anything could strike you we've had when we lost in 2014 when we lost a window the glass from the window embedded in the wall in the chip rock in the wall in the other side of the room right and at the same time there was uh, shingles from uh, one person's house it was actually embedded in the wall in the exterior wall of another house like that's the debris that's flying around mm -hmm. so if something happens that you lose a window and you're not able to get it uh, secure that there's a risk of losing your roof because that's what will happen the change in pressure like we all know the kids know that if you lose a window run and open a window on the other side of the house immediately so that the wind can go okay. through and there's no build up so of pressure your yeah how to yeah an emergency that's important yeah done at school or mainly through parents? we just we just do it as yeah as parents but uh, but and the other thing too though actually that's act happen is that there are now uh, when wind warnings become over a certain threshold the schools close okay. that's a new thing that didn't happen uh, like 20 years ago so what do you think needs to be done in the future to better adapt to the changes in climate well I think that we need to implement some uh, building protocols around here I think that uh, for example, when we built our house, we put vinyl siding on. I think there are some parts in our community that are sort of in the wind alley of wind alley. Vinyl siding shouldn't be allowed because it'll rip off the houses. It's blowing around. It's dangerous. It's causing damage to other people's houses. So we changed ours over to, uh, to uh, clapboard. And most of the houses around where we live, actually, they changed over to uh, you know wood siding and stuff. Uh, and I think that hurricane ties should be mandatory. Like, you should have to submit your building plans mm -hmm. around. And so some of those things should be happening. The things that we talked about or we just heard about here with respect to uh, driveways and stuff like that, there should be uh, plans in place around that. Our driveway, where it is, actually, it's a straight-up slope. And it's not that big of a slope, but it washes out mm -hmm. all the time. And all that debris is washing onto the road the main road through the community and washing over onto someone else's property. Mm -hmm. They must get upset about it, like I would be. And we're trying to fix it, but really, when we put in our plans to put our houses there 20 years ago, we, if we had known that driveway shouldn't have been designed the way it was, the access to that piece of property could have been done so that you know, you're doing that zipper back. Uh, Some more design requirements to yeah. deal with these kinds of events in yep, mind. Yeah, that's right. Okay, um, what kind of support do you think is needed to, to make that, those kind of changes happen? I think that, oh gosh, support. I think that should be involved. You know? Yeah, well I think everyone should be involved because it affects everybody. And uh, I think that uh, the community councils who are all volunteers need to, need to be supported by the provincial government, but also by the people in the communities who know like, I know, for example, just from my experience, some of the things, and I think the community council needs to know that I have their back. When they say, Trudy, you need to do this on your, counts on your property, this is the way you can develop it if you want to do something, I need to tell, let them know that I'm trusting them to implement the rules and the policies that we know that we should be following because it's for my benefit in the long run as long as well as my neighbors and stuff, so right? Residents need to be on side with, yeah. with these kinds of changes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you're welcome. <laughs>